Hello and welcome. This is Will Rems for Create the Learning Site, the place to go deeper in your understanding of the Bible. Why this title, In Honor of Jesus? It's not related to the topic for this month, but it is because this is number 60, which means 5 times 12. Next month, I complete five years of Create the Learning Site. In other words, there is a celebration coming up and I'm reminding myself for whom I am doing this, in honor of Jesus. In January of last year, I did an issue on the authorship of John's Gospel, based on a book by Richard Brockham. The answer turned out is not as simple as the phrase the author of John might suggest. And I finished with this statement, a mental note to myself, on my reading list, Richard Borkham, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. After reading Borkham's study of John, I very much wanted to read his book on all four Gospels. Little did I know that it would take me more than a year until I would finally get around to it, but now I did and it was an exhilarating read. In order to fully appreciate Borkham's effort, we need to know a little bit about what is called form criticism. It used to be a formidable force in New Testament studies and is still influential today, and it is what Borkham argues against. Obviously, the Gospels consist of numerous individual stories that may well have circulated independently of each other. Form criticism recognized that these stories can be classified in different types, the forms in form criticism, and argued that each had its own specific use, its, with the German term, sits im Leben, in the life of the early church. Something that is doubtful and remained unproven. More importantly, these stories had in many cases been created or invented by the church for these varying purposes. This took place over a long period of time as stories were passed on orally by word of mouth before they were written down, all the while uh, developing and evolving as they were adjusted to the changing needs of the church. These stories, so foreign critics, tell us a lot about the communities that crafted them, but not much about the historical Jesus. Foreign critics pointed to oral tradition as it exists in many people groups today as a clear parallel to this process of gospel formation. Ironically, foreign criticism didn't actually study oral tradition in the real world. The parallel between the evolving gospel tradition and oral tradition was based on theoretical considerations. Foreign critics were therefore unaware of two notable features of oral tradition. First, such traditions can be remarkably stable over time. One does not easily create or invent a new tradition. Second, such traditions were passed on over generations, not merely a few decades. In fact, it does not make sense to speak of oral tradition if the generation who experienced the events is still alive. When the Gospels were eventually written down, at least some of the eyewitnesses and many who had heard them firsthand were still alive. Oral tradition, therefore, is not a parallel to Gospel formation. As Richard Bockham points out, we imagine the traditions passing through many minds and mouths before they reach the writers of the Gospels. But the period in question is actually that of a relatively, for that period, long lifetime. And, a second quote, if, as I shall argue in this book, the period between the historical Jesus and the Gospels was actually spanned not by anonymous community transmission, 
but by the continuing presence and testimony of the eyewitnesses, who remained the authoritative sources of their traditions until their death, then the usual way of thinking of oral tradition are not appropriate at all. Bokham repeatedly turns to the very little that has survived of the writings of the church father Papias. It's only a few fragments, and he does so for good reasons. Papias lived from approximately AD 60 until 130 in the Roman province of Asia, and he is our earliest source outside of the Bible for the authorship of the Gospels. Papias personally knew two of the daughters of the evangelist Philip, and many of those who had been taught by the original disciples of Jesus and their successors. As a young man, he eagerly sought them out to learn what the apostles and other disciples of Jesus had taught. In these cases, he was therefore only one or two steps removed from the original source. What we find in Papias is nothing like an anonymous tradition, creating stories out of thin air, but instead a strong desire to get as close to the original witnesses, known by name, and their testimony as possible. This hardly comes as a surprise, considering that Jesus called the twelve disciples explicitly for this specific role, to be witnesses. They were to be, in the words of Borkheim, the guarantors of the core of the gospel traditions. Each of the synoptic gospels, Mark, Matthew and Luke, includes an exact list of these twelve. With this, they document the authoritative source of the traditions they were writing down. As Borkham puts it, it is the contention of this book that, in the period up to the writing of the Gospels, Gospel traditions were connected with named and known eyewitnesses, people who had heard the teaching of Jesus from his lips and committed it to memory, people who had witnessed the events of his ministry, death and resurrection, and themselves had formulated the stories about these events that they told. These eyewitnesses did not merely set going a process of oral transmission that soon went its own way without reference to them. They remained throughout their lifetimes the authoritative guarantors of the stories they continued to tell. In Luke's words, these were those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, who had delivered these things to us. Presumably, he knew many of them by name. The Greek word delivered in Luke 1 is a technical term for the passing on of a tradition. Paul used the same terminology when he spoke of receiving and delivering the gospel tradition, as in this example from 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. So when the time came to put this tradition in writing, the eyewitnesses were still known and served as guarantors of what was written down. Here is another pointer to this. In the Gospel of Mark, the very first disciple named is Peter in Mark 1 verse 16. He is also the last one named in the Gospel in Mark 16 verse 7. This forms a so-called inclusio or a bracket around the bulk of the gospel. Bokem points to parallels in Greek history writing to argue that this shows Peter to be the main source for Mark's gospel. Interestingly, Luke, who appears to have borrowed much from Mark, has his own inclusio, different from Mark, using different stories, but with the same effect. Again, Simon is the first disciple named in Luke 4, and the last one in Luke 24. Matthew does not have such an inclusio, but John does. In John, one of the first two disciples who follow Jesus remains anonymous. The other one is Andrew, the brother of Peter. A strong case can be made that this is the disciple later described as the disciple whom Jesus loved, who will also turn out to be the author of this gospel. As such, he is the last disciple mentioned in John 21. 
In each of these three cases, the inclusio identifies the main source, the most important witness for the respective gospel. John, in fact, is even more subtle. Right after the first appearance of the unnamed disciple in chapter 1, Peter appears for the first time. And right before the last reverence to the unnamed disciple whom Jesus loved, Peter appears for the last time. Assuming the unnamed disciple is John, whether the apostle or the elder, uh, the inclusio is therefore John Peter, Peter John. This suggests that the unnamed disciple is in an even better position to be a witness to Jesus than Peter. Bockham points to additional linguistic parallels between John 1 and John 21 that make this inclusio even stronger. The above shows the Gospels to be in line with what would have been considered best practice in ancient history writing. Ideally, the author himself would have been involved in the events described and would have experienced them firsthand. Obviously, what was valued was not objectivity, but an inside perspective. If the author was not himself an eyewitness, he should seek out those who were and base his account on their testimony, the way Luke does. This helps us to make sense of a statement by Papias that has often been misunderstood. Papias wrote, For I did not think that information from books would profit me as much as information from a living and surviving voice. Now, Papias is not referring here to oral tradition. It does not mean that he would rather hear something passed on by word of mouth rather than have it in writing. The living and surviving voice is an eyewitness, someone who was there and can speak from personal experience. Papias wants to hear what those who were present when it happened, those who had been with Jesus, had said from a reliable second or third hand source if necessary, but as close to the original voice as still possible. Since each document had to be copied by hand, writing could easily be tampered with. This is of course true for oral tradition as well, but not for direct eyewitness testimony. Provided the witness was reliable, this was the most trustworthy source of information available. This is what Papias was pursuing and what the Gospels are based on. Last quote from Richard Bockham. In this book, I have followed Samuel Burscock in arguing that the Gospels, though in some ways a very distinctive form of historiography, share broadly in the attitude to eyewitness testimony that was common among historians in the Greco-Roman period. These historians valued above all reports of first-hand experience of the events they recounted. Best of all was for the historian to have been himself a participant in the events, direct autopsy, failing that, and no historian was present at all the events he needed to recount, not least because usually some would be simultaneous, they sought informants who could speak from first-hand knowledge and whom they could interview in direct autopsy. Best practice included other features beyond basing an account on eyewitness testimony. The account should show chronological order, literary arrangement and elucidation. It should provide a coherent, continuous and comprehensive account. Now, we don't know what Papias thought of Luke, but when it came to Mark and Matthew, Papias felt they lacked the sophistication of order and arrangement, but he nevertheless defended them. In Mark's case, it was because Mark had not himself been an eyewitness. He did the best he could by faithfully recording the stories told by Peter, but since he was not an eyewitness, he could not do more. In Matthew's case, the original had been written in Hebrew, so Papias seems to have believed, and had been translated by different people who had not been eyewitnesses. And in the process, the original order and arrangement had been largely lost.
Now, whether Papias was right in this is a different matter, but such were his convictions. The implication of this, so Richard Bauckham argues, is that Papias would have considered John's Gospel superior. Now, I don't think it's helpful to argue about which Gospel is the greatest, but that's not the point here. It's interesting why Papias would have considered John superior. It is because John gave us an eyewitness account in order. John pays substantial attention to chronological detail and with significant sophistication. He provides a more continuous narrative than the other Gospels and gives profound insight in who Jesus was and why he did what he did. In other words, more than the other Gospels, John fulfilled the expectations of good history writing. In addition to facts, he also gives us his own inter understanding and interpretation of Jesus. And since John had an insider perspective, both his facts and his interpretation are trustworthy. It's becoming a long recording, but there's one more thing from the book I want to share. Bauckham devotes an entire chapter, chapter 4, to Jewish names used in Palestine in the time between 330 BC and AD 200. The six most common names are listed here, Simon, Joseph, Judah, Eleazar, Johanan or John, and Joshua or Jesus. These six names account for roughly 40% of the Jewish names in Palestine from this time period that we know. Although all these names appear in the Hebrew Bible, Balcom argues that they were not given for this reason. Rather, they appear because, with the exception of Joshua and possibly Joseph, they are the names of the sons of Matathias. Also known as the Maccabeans, they are members of the Jewish priestly family that rose up in rebellion against the Syrian oppressors in the 2nd century BC. This tells us something about Jewish aspirations and the strength of Jewish nationalism at the time. The name of Joshua, of course, as the one who defeated the Canaanites and took possession of the land of Israel, fits right in. It is also noteworthy that certain biblical names do not appear, at least not in Palestine. We do not know of anyone named Moses, Elijah or David during these centuries. Since, according to varying messianic expectations, each of these three was expected to return, it may have been thought too presumptuous to name one son after one of these coming liberators. That's it for this month. Next month, we'll celebrate five years, create a learning site. I hope you'll be there.